Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to walk you through vSAN architecture. If you don't know what vSAN is, this is going to be a great introductory video for you. It's VMware's hyper-converged infrastructure solution. So it's a way to really combine local storage across multiple hosts to make it look like one um, SAN device, hence the name Virtual SAN. Um, so let, let's jump right into it. Let's go into some of the architecture. And you know, before we jump into what vSAN offers, I think it's important to understand why vSAN was even created in the first place. What's the problem we're trying to solve for? Especially as we have centralized storage with different SAN devices. Um, but that really starts with, with understanding first how traditional storage models work, right? So we have things like iSCSI, NFS, block channel, you name it. And, and let's say we have, as you can see here, a traditional virtual machine, we'll call it VM1 in this case, running on an ESXi host. So you can see we have ESXi running here. And that virtual machine data is going to be stored in some sort of data store that's backed by some sort of iSCSI LUN or an NFS data store. You know, either way, the storage has to be predefined with some sort of RAID protection. For example, let's say for, for our use case here, our data store is configured with RAID 5, as you can see on the diagram here, which is fine, you know, it works absolutely great, works as intended, but what happens when a request comes in for a new VM that requires either some sort of RAID 6 or RAID 1 protection? Well, you know, we can't put it in our current data store that's configured for RAID 5, so we have to put that VM in a new data store. And that, v, that data store right, has to be configured with the appropriate RAID configuration, so RAID 1 or RAID 6. So you can see that the configuration of the storage service, it's not done in this scenario on the VM level, it's actually done on the storage level, the, the LUN level. And as an administrator, this requires you to pre-configure everything in advance and you may not want to always know or you may not always know what storage option you'll actually be needing. And then you have to go to the storage administrator if you're with a larger organization to configure this for you. So what are we doing with vSAN? With vSAN, we're eliminating the need to configure the services on the storage side and we're putting it on the VM side using something called storage-based policy management, or you might better know it as SPBM. By enabling the storage policies to be configured at the VM level, if requests ever come in to quickly deploy an application that needs a certain level of RAID protection, take RAID 5 or RAID 6 as an example, we don't have to wait for the storage team, for the storage administrator to provide us with those storage services. We can simply configure in vSphere that the VM needs that level of RAID protection and vSphere can automatically do that and deploy that for us. So if we talk through what is vSAN, again, vSAN is VMware's hyper-converged infrastructure solution in which vSAN pools direct attached storage devices, so various hosts, across a vSphere cluster and creates a distributed shared data store across those direct attached storage. The vSAN data store can provide all of your storage services on a per VM level. So if we take a, a VM that requires RAID 1 or RAID 6 protection, we can have them both live in the same vSAN data store and there is no longer this need to reconfigure storage for different storage services to actually make this happen. So vSAN is also distributed. So from the ESXi host perspective, when they send stuff to the vSAN data store, the vSAN algorithm, the, all the intelligence behind it is smart enough to understand which of the hosts in the cluster the data for the VM will actually be stored. However, in order for vSAN to work appropriately, just like any other technology solution, there's some prerequisites you know, required and you can see those here on the, the right side of, of the slide. We have to ensure that the correct version of vSphere as well as vCenter is running. There needs to be a VM kernel port configured for vSAN traffic, which is going over layer three connectivity. If you don't know what a VM kernel port is, think of it as just a management port that is needed for that type of traffic. Um, there's actually a great hands-on lab. I'll, I'll include a link on the, the comments so you can take a look at that. That shows you how to configure these prerequisites for the, the networking side of the house for vSAN. Um, there's a minimum of three ESXi hosts in a cluster. 
Um, the network requires either one gig or 10 gig. One gig is you know recommended for lab or develop development um, environments, whereas 10 gig is going to be your production environment. And then there's a requirement for at least one SSD and one hard disk per host. And this could be one SSD plus one. SSD per host, um, so note that it's just one and one. And also to provide an example here, so you can see I have an architecture diagram shown here. We have three individual ESXi hosts. Again, this is our minimum for, for vSAN. And on each of these hosts, we have a VM NIC, which is a physical ethernet port on an ESXi host, which is connected to one of two 10 gigabyte switches. So you can see we have VM NIC 0, VM NIC 1, they're each attached to a separate switch for redundancy. So this is following best practices. We also have a v vSAN VM kernel port here. So these are the vSAN VM K2 that you see here, which is used for our VMs to transmit traffic related to vSAN from host to host. And remember, this is a prerequisite for vSAN to work appropriately. So let's talk through how the VM objects are actually stored and how the VM kernel ports are being leveraged. So here we have a virtual machine that's running on ESXi01, and this VM is stored on a vCN data store. And as this VM has reads and writes that need to be executed, they're gonna be pushed over the physical network using the vCN VM kernel port to the appropriate destination host. So whether that be um, the VMDK and ESXi02 or the VMDK and ESXi03. So let's say ESXi02 is the active VMDK. Um, we have a mirror VMDK that's going to live on ESXi03 and that's to have a failure to tolerate should one of these go that goes down. So it's, it's in case of this primary going down. As you can see, if we are going, let me get my pen here. If we are you know, creating that copy, doing that right, it's not letting me write. Uh, let's see what we got, let's try this. So, there we go. As we're doing that right, and we're going through the switch and making that right to our VMDK on our primary as well as on our copy, the, the VM kernel port is responsible for handling all of that traffic and it's gonna have um, the control over the flow of the vSAN network. So it's, it's critical to the architecture. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, vSAN has this requirement of at least one SSD as well as one hard drive or hard disk or another SSD. And the reason for that is with a vSAN architecture, you have to have two tiers. You have a cache tier as well as a capacity tier. So in this specific configuration, this is what you call a hybrid configuration because we have a mix of SSDs as well as hard drives. So we have our SSD here, as well as our hard drive here. Um, you could also have an all flash tier in which this case, the hard drive is also an SSD. But it comes down to a conversation, you know, SSD is gonna be a lot faster, um, but it's a lot more expensive than traditional spinning disks as well. So depending on your budget and how fast you need the environment, you'd go with one configuration over the other. So let, let's say we have um, a VM that wants to read data from the virtual disk. So I'll we'll build out the, the architecture here. And we can see in a second here that the VM kernel port is used to push that read over the physical network to the appropriate host. But looks what, look what happens, right? So we have, um, and it's hitting the SSD, it's hitting the cache tier first on ESXi02 very quickly. So the purpose of this read cache is a store copy of the most frequently read data on that SSD. And there's also a copy of that same data along with the other data for the VM on the capacity tier as well. So on this guy here, right? So on the, the actual hard disk. And if the data is not presented on the SSD, it will read the data from that capacity tier, which is much slower than of course, if we're gonna go through the cache tier, which is a solid state drive versus a, a traditional spinning disk. And, you know, so that's reads, but what about writes, right? So the, the first thing to remember is not only is there a VMDK for the virtual machine on ESXi02, so on this guy here, but there's also one on our ESXi3 here. And, you know, this is just in case this guy fails for whatever reason, we have a backup here. 
So again, yeah, want to drill that into all of you so you know that where redundancy is a, is a big deal for vSAN. When a write occurs, the VM needs to be executed and the write is going to be sent to both of the ESXi hosts as, and they're going to be mirrored, right? That way they both always have a current version of the VMDK just in case you know failure occurs. Also, you may have noticed that during the write, it hit the SSD first. And that's because the writes are carried out through the write buffer that's on the SSD and 30% of the actual SSD on the cache tier is dedicated as a write buffer. And this helps improve the performance of the write operations for that VM. So from the perspective of the VM, once a write action hits the SSD, it's done. Then the capacity device does all the hard work from there. So from an end user perspective, it's gonna feel a lot more fast, faster. Um, so when the cache starts running out of space, the cache starts to actually the stage stuff over to the capacity tier. So when that 30% start getting full, that's when we start moving that over to that, that spinning disk. Uh, did I click one too many? No, we're good. Um, so now that we understand the difference between the capacity tier as well as the cache tier, let's talk about disk groups. So if you don't know what a disk group is, it's a unit of compute in a vSAN cluster, and it's a collection of disks that exists in the host in that cluster. And in a disk group, you have your capacity tier as well as your cache tier. And a vSAN host can have up to, to five disk groups each. So we only have four here, so we can add one additional more. And we, we can, within each disk group, we can have up to seven capacity devices as well as one cache device. So you can see we have, you know, com combining these two together, we have eight total disks per disk group. So if we times that by five, because we can have up to five disk groups, we can have 40 total disks that live in each disk group or in each host. Um, yeah, no, each disk group, yeah. You can also choose to deploy this in two different options, right? You can either deploy this as a hybrid option as we see here. So in this case, we have a mix of hard drives as well as solid state drives. Um, in this scenario, again, 30% of the cache tier is dedicated to writes. The other 70% is dedicated to our reads or you can deploy a full flash option, which is this guy here in which everything is 100% right only at the cache tier. So that's because you know everything at the capacity tier is also super fast. You're gonna have the same speed with the cache as you do with the, the actual capacity tier. So if you go hybrid or all flash, every disk group in the cluster has to be either hybrid or all flash. So you can't say like, hey, we want this guy, this guy here to be hybrid, this one to be hybrid, this one to be flash, and this one to be hybrid. It doesn't work that way. They're all gonna to have to be hybrid in order for this deployment to work. Lastly, it's highly recommended that all of your hosts and your vSAN cluster have an equal number of disks as it greatly simplifies planning for any sort of disaster recovery, any sort of failure in the future. Last couple of things I wanna leave you all with is an overview of the vSAN objects and the failure to tolerate options. Within vSAN, each object is composed of a set of components, right? And it's, it's determined by the capabilities that are used in the VM storage policy. The five objects, as you can see listed here, we have the VM home namespace, the VM swap file, the VMDK, snapshot delta VMDKs, as well as the memory object. So the, the home namespace, this is a home directory in which the VM configuration files are stored. So think of like a VMX file, um, VMDKs, etc. The VM swap file, it's an object that's created when the VM is powered on and is used to actually prevent memory contention. Um, the VMDK file, this is the virtual, machi the virtual machine's virtual disk. Um, the snapshot VMDK file is a snapshot's virtual disk. Um, it's also important to understand the failure to tolerate options. So I have quite a bit listed out here, um, as well as the host requirements for each of those and the storage consumption for the different failure to, failure to tolerate the FTT scenarios. So I provided a, a diagram here on the bottom for a couple of examples here. I'm guessing I'm blocking out this bottom one on the bottom right, but that's okay. If we look at the left here, this is our failure to tolerate equals one scenario. 
Um, when we say our failure to tolerate equals one, that means we can lose one host. So we can lose like this guy here and you know we can still have an active application. In this scenario, we have our three hosts minimum. So you can see here and across these three hosts, we have our VM. So we have this one and we have our two VMDK files. So very similar to what we've been showing earlier in, in today's video. Um, we also have a witness, which is composed of only, only composed of VM metadata, metadata. So it's fairly small and doesn't take up much space. And what it does is it acts as a tiebreaker in the case of a failure. So if this guy again goes down here, um, you know, let's say it loses network connectivity for whatever reason, if we didn't have a witness, both host two and host three will have like a scenario in which they're not able to determine which one is down. So in other words, we'll notice that in this scenario, they might both become active because they can't tell which one's a surviving one. So what the witness does is it has a vote within all three hosts and says, oh, no, I see VMDK running on ESXi02, but I don't see it running on ESXi03, which means we're going to say, yeah, for sure, this, this guy here is down, and this is one our one that's up and running, so this one's good. And that's the responsibility of the witness. Um, you may also notice that our storage requirements for this one is two times storage. So let's say if we had 100 gig VMDK, 100 gig VM, we're gonna consume 200 gigs worth of storage in this scenario. If we look at the diagram on the right, and I know I'm blocking a part of it, sorry for that, but um, we have RAID 1 still, but our fair to tolerate equals two, which means we can still lose two hosts. So let's say we lost this guy and this guy here, and we still have you know our application that's running perfectly fine. In this scenario, you know, we have three VMDK files. So we have one, two, three, and we have two witnesses. So on this one, and you probably can't see this, but on this guy right here. So in this type of scenario, we have, since we have three VMDKs, we're using three X storage. And, you know, meaning again, if we have a hundred gigs of a hundred gigs of data for our VM, we're consuming 300 gigs in this scenario. Um, we also of course have RAID 5 and RAID 6 deployments which requires either 1.3x storage or 1.5x storage. So just note that as well. All right, the very last thing I wanna leave everyone with is the default vSAN storage policy. This is something I had a little bit of trouble digging up myself, so I thought it'd be pertinent just to share it with all of you. So if you were to deploy vSAN and you didn't set up any storage policies, this would be your default one. You can see here that our fair to tolerate equals one, our stripe width is one, meaning we have no striping. So this is gonna be RAID one, our flash read cache reservation and object space reservation is zero. Um, this is actually recommended in most instances, um, but I'll provide a couple of links in the comments so you can actually go in and take a look of, you know, what exactly is being configured for, for these two guys here. And we also have a force provisioning equals no, which prevents a VM from being created at the vSAN data store doesn't meet the VM storage policy. So typically we'd want that as no, but there are certain circumstances where you might wanna change that to yes, depending on your, your storage policy. So that, that's everything I have for today's video. Um, hopefully this was helpful to, to all of you. Again, if you liked today's video, would really appreciate if you give me a thumbs up to my video, subscribe to my channel. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to write in the comments below and I'll try to answer that as best as I can and as timely as I can as well. Um, take care everyone and thanks for tuning in.